This is Dr. Mobeen Sayed from drbean.com. So we are going to start our lecture today. We are continuing with those drugs that are part of Math Plus protocol, and we have not discussed them before. So today we will discuss prostacycline, or the commercial salt that is available is the apoprostinol. So let's talk about the apoprostinol. Fascinating drug, very important drug. It is a blood thinner by what it does is it inactivates the platelets. So let's look at the mechanism of action. So here we have apoprostinol or PGI2 or prostaglandin I2 or prostacycline. They're all the names for the same uh, drug. Or actually this is a this is a kind of a hormone that is produced in our cells. The difference from other hormones is that hormones are normally produced by a specific gland and then sent out throughout the body. In case of prostaglandins or these uh, arachidonic acid derivatives, they are produced by many, many cells and they do not go too far in the body. They kind of work nearby and in that way, they are kind of paracrine as well. So they're kind of hormones, not exact definition of a hormone. So the, how does a prostacycline work? How does apoprostinol work? Let's look at that. So here, this is a cell membrane. And I've just taken a piece of a cell membrane. We have done this discussion in the past as well, that there is, the cell membrane is made up of phospholipids. So if you see here, this is a bilayer of phospholipids. These blue things outside are phosphates, and these um, blue lines are lipids. So phospholipids, inside the cell, there is an enzyme called phospholipase A2. When that works, that causes the phospholipid to become converted to arachidonic acid. And we've done this discussion in the past as well. Arachidonic acid in turn, so this is happening inside a cell, and especially please remember it is happening inside a platelet. Arachidonic acid is then converted to PGH2 by enzymes, a pair of enzymes called cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2, or we call them lovingly COX-1 and COX-2. Do not take any uh, ideas from that. So here, PGH2 in turn is acted upon by various kinds of enzymes. And then within the cell, again, we are talking inside the cell, PGH2 can be converted to PGI2. This is what we are talking about today, or prostacycline. It also can be converted to thromboxin A2, and then PGF2 and PGE2. For us today, more important are PGI2 and thromboxin A2. And we'll talk about that in a second. Let me just go here for a second. This one is lipooxygenase. Arachidonic acid can also have the action of lipooxygenase enzyme on it, which converts that into 5-H-PEAT, which in turn then converts into leukotriene B4, leukotriene C4, which can then be converted to leuko leukotriene D4 and E4. So these are derivatives of arachidonic acid, which are further derivatives from membrane phospholipids. Now, please remember this. If we come here to our discussion area today, prostaglandin and pro thromboxin A2. Prostaglandin, as you can see, my poor attempt of making a dude here, that is trying to open up a blood vessel. A prostaglandin is a vasodilator. And secondly, if you see here, he's standing in between two platelets. Platelets are trying to hug each other and combine with each other and aggregate. But prostaglandin is standing, or this is called prostacycline, PGI2. Prostacycline is standing between them and stopping them from aggregating. So that is the basic drug we're going to talk about. That is the apoprostinol, and we're going to talk about the mechanism of action. But before we go there, please remember that thromboxin A2 does the opposite of prostacycline. Thromboxin A2 is a vasoconstrictor, plus it helps the platelets with their aggregation. So normally in our body, there is a balance of these two, the production of thromboxin A2 and the production of prostacycline. They are kept in a balance where Whenever we need clotting, we can have clotting. And normally, when we do not need clotting, 
there is no clotting. So that balance is struck. So here is a note that thromboxin A2 from activated platelets. Now, this is a very important part. And as we would do aspirin, I think this would also become thromboxin A2 is present in activated platelets. And today we'll discuss what is the activated platelet. Prostacycline is released from endothelial cells. So if you think about it for a second, what happens is that a platelet is trying to cause thrombosis or clotting and a blood vessel is trying that this does not happen. So there is a fight and a balance between these two. Endothelium is trying that there should be no clotting, there should be no thrombus, there should be then no embolism, no bad things happening. And thromboxin A2 or platelets are trying that, hey, we should become active and we should become aggregated. So of course, all, in all healthy people, the balance is in a way that there is no thrombosis and there is no aggregation. All right, so now let's continue. Let's look at platelets for a second. Once again, please take away prostacycline would, would inhibit platelet aggregation. The question that is, that is in our mind at this time is, how does it do that? So let's look at a platelet very quickly. Platelets are produced, here if you see, this is a bone. Inside the bone, there are cells that are called megakaryocytes. Megakaryocytes or big cells. These big cells, they are broken down into smaller pieces. Those smaller pieces are like little plates. They are li like little discs. These tiny discs are called platelets. These discs or these tiny cells do not have nucleus in them. They just have enough enzymes to make thromboxane and make other ATP and ADP type things. They do not have a nucleus in them. The other way that a megakaryocyte can develop or break into platelets is that when a megakaryocyte comes out of the bone marrow and goes into the blood vessels, and then it goes into capillaries, capillaries are very small and it gets stuck over there and then it starts breaking down. And so inside the capillaries as well, megakaryocytes give rise to smaller discs, which are, um, which are platelets. So they kind of, if you visualize a movie in which there is a, there is a hero and that hero then disintegrates into smaller pieces and maybe becomes birds and flies away, that is what a megakaryocyte does. So here are the platelets, they look like platelets. Normally in one microliter of the blood, there are 150,000 to 300,000 platelets. Inside a platelet, there are many, many important things and this is really the important part now. Important things are platelets, do you know platelets are like tiny muscles? They, they have their own little muscle proteins in them that allows them to contract. So platelets have, if you see here at the top, Platelets have actin in them, myosin in them, and thrombosthenin in them. All of those are contractile proteins. They would help the platelet contract. And we would talk about it that how does it happen? Again, please keep in mind, epiprostinol is going to stop this action of the platelets. So we're looking at how platelets are going to work. And then, of course, epiprostinol is going to stop that. Now, inside the platelet, there are other things as well. For example, they have mitochondria to make ATP, ADP. They have phospholipase enzyme, which we just talked about in the previous scene where we said phospholipase A2 is going to help create arachidonic acid, which would help create the uh, prostacyclines, thromboxin A2 and leukotrienes. So that enzyme is present. Of course, COX-1 and COX-2 enzyme are present. Lipoxygenases are present and so on. They also have a fibrin stabilizing factor, all of those things should give you this idea that one, platelets can be contractile. Second, they take part in clotting and thrombosing. This is why they're also called thrombocytes. They make thrombi. Okay, continuing. So here, we're going to start from this little cartoon I made. Maybe we should make that on, on a t-shirt and and sell that t-shirt, but here is a cartoon. So there are two platelets that are at rest that are going to sleep. And what are they talking about? They're saying, hey, bro, I like ka calcium more than Z's. Remember when we make our cartoons or when we make somebody sleeping, we say they are, 
they, there are Z's in them. Platelets, when they are resting, they are releasing calciums. So remember, they like ka more than Z. So they like to do ka. Maybe they're little crows. So here, these are resting platelets. And at rest, they, they are releasing calcium from them. So question is, why are they releasing calcium? And what is the role? How does this happen? So now let's come here. This is a resting platelet as well. What happens is that this is a platelet that is moving about in the blood circulation. The, this thing down here is an endothelial cell. This is a cell of our blood vessel. Endothelial cells normally produce prostacyclines. This is the drug we are talking about. Prostacycline is produced from inside our body, but we can manufacture it outside as well and then give it as a drug, administer that as a drug, and that drug is apoprosinol. So what happens is normally endothelial cells continue to produce prostacyclines. Prostacycline, what they do is they connect with the receptor on a platelet and they cause increase in cyclic AMP production inside a platelet. And when the cyclic AMP is increased inside a platelet, that cyclic AMP causes the calcium channels in the platelet to open up. That allows the calcium to escape from the platelet. This is the most important part, the core of our discussion today. <coughs> Excuse me. So when calcium escapes from a platelet, this is why a platelet at rest is doing ka, ka, it is releasing calcium. The low calcium inside a platelet means resting state. If there is a way for us to increase the calcium level in a platelet by blocking this channels, this channel for the calcium, then the platelet will become active. So please remember the next part of our discussion that platelet activity means that platelet has more calcium in it. And to have more calcium, it is necessary that we do not have the calcium channels open. And to have the calcium channels not open, we need to have some way that PGI2 is not present. On the other hand, if you give PGI2 from outside, that is going to come in and make the platelets go to sleep. How? By opening their calcium channels and they would go at rest and they would not work and there would be no thrombosis. So let's continue our discussion. So see here, let's say over here, this is a blood vessel. This is an area of the blood vessel where there is damage in the blood vessel here. Because of the damage, we have done this discussion in the past. What happens is that when the damage to blood vessel occurs, for example, in case of COVID-19, the ACE2 receptor binding by the SARS-CoV-2 causes the angiotensin 2 to become more than angiotensin 1 to 7. We've, we've done this discussion in the past. That angiotensin 2 is pro-inflammatory, and the end result is that the vessel wall get damaged. When the vessel wall is damaged, that is a hypercoagulability state, correct? That's what we're talking about. When the vessel wall is damaged, the collagen fibers that are present outside of the vessel, that are present in the subendothelial areas, they become exposed to blood. When they become exposed to blood, we have talked about it in the past that there are many von Willebrand factor and everything else takes part in it. Here, what is important is this is a collagen fiber that is exposed. There are platelets in the blood that have now come in contact with it. Platelets would do two things. If you see here, platelets have a glycoprotein on it, which are, which are little, little proteins that are on the surface of the platelet. This glycoprotein we're talking about is called glycoprotein 1B. This glycoprotein 1B binds with collagen. However, it binds more strongly if one von Wil Wilbrandt factor is present. In the presence of the von Wilbrandt factor, the collagen binds with platelet in a more strong way. And that is a, you can say that the von Wilbrandt factor acts as a bridge or a, or a glue to, to bind the collagen with the platelet. So this binding is stronger than if the platelet was trying to bind to the collagen by itself. So once this binding occurs, what happens is that platelet is now going to become active. 
and how does it become active? Let's look at it here first. What happens is in a platelet that needs to become active, we connect ADP on it. We put ADP on it and we'll see in a second how that ADP comes in. But we add ADP, adenosine diphosphate. And when the ADP is increased, what happens is or bound here to the platelet that causes adenylate cyclase adenylate late cyclase that is an enzyme present inside the platelet it reduces the activity of that enzyme when that enzyme's activity is reduced then that enzyme is functioning to produce cyclic amp so remember if you are a platelet for example and you are resting in you adenylate cyclase is making cyclic amp which is helping to keep the calcium channels open calcium is escaping from the body and the platelet is resting and sleeping now when we when we reduce the function of adenylate cyclase that causes reduction in cyclic amp production which in turn will cause reduction in calcium escape those calcium channels would not work correctly because cyclic amp is not available in sufficient quantities when the cyclic amp is not available and calcium channels are not working there is another thing and that is adp and atp levels would increase our our cell for example platelet can use the energy substrates and either make cyclic AMP or it can make ADP or it can make ATP. So here, this platelet is becoming active. And how is it becoming active? By not making enough cyclic AMP and instead making ADP and ATP. When we have more ADP and ATP, then the calcium channels would now be blocked and the calcium would start accumulating inside the platelet an accumulated amount of calcium, a higher volume of calcium inside a platelet tells the platelet to be active. So that is the basic difference. Low calcium levels, platelet is sleeping. Higher calcium level, platelet is active. So now let's see how does it do that. So going back here, it is an injury to the blood vessel that caused a platelet to come and bind there. This binding of the platelet to the collagen causes the internal changes in the platelet. And what platelet does is it has a small bag in it. You can, these are vesicles. That small bag, there are a couple of bags that are important. One of them is called dense body. So here, this one is a dense body. Dense body contains ADP, ATP, and calcium. So these guys, the dense body will become open to the exterior and release its content. What are the contents? ADP, ATP, and calcium. So it kind of spills them out in the blood. That causes ATP, ADP to come out. ADP then works on the same platelet. Over here, if you see, it is working on the same platelet from where it was released, plus it is working on the other platelets nearby. And that is how platelet activation starts. So what is the basic process? Vessel injury, platelet binding to it. When the platelet binds to the collagen, that causes the platelet to shed its dense body uh, content. And the dense body content have ADP, which in turn will activate the same platelet from where it is released, plus other platelets that were running around in the blood as well. Now what happens when the platelet becomes active, the result of that is that platelets would start creating small spicules. Have you seen sometimes birds that when they are angry, they become all puffed up and they have their, and they have their, uh, they become all puffed up and they have the, they become bigger. So same way when the platelet becomes puffed up, what it does is it has those spicules, we call them small projections from the platelet that come out these projections start intertwining with the other active platelet and that is how they would start aggregating or connecting with each other. So once the um, ADP is present, platelet is activating, the other thing it does is if you see here this red thing, that is a phospholipid complex. So imagine that from a, from a platelet, there are sirens that are going off that there is some damage and then on the surface of the platelet, we have projections of phospholipids. So when the phospholipids come out as well, what they do is they allow thrombin here, 
thrombin, thromboxin A2, ADP. Now remember thromboxin A2, we talked about it just above. Thromboxin A2 is also released from platelets. Thromboxin A2 and ADP and thrombin, they connect together to then allow fibrinogen to become active, which is this fiber here, and other clotting factors to become active. Eventually, what is happening is an aggregate of the platelets is going to form here. A thrombus is going to form here, which would have fibrinogen or fibrin fibers on it as well. So this is a, a plug of platelets, which is tied together by these spicules or the platelets are holding hands, plus there are fibrin threads. So this is how the platelets would aggregate. Now, if we have prostacycline, or if we have apoprostinol, what does happen? So as we saw here, that apoprostinol causes the calcium to eject from platelets. So imagine these are the platelets that are active. We give them apoprostinol. Apoprostinol is going to come in and cause the calcium to eject from the platelet. When the calcium is ejected, that would cause the platelets to go to sleep. And when they'll go to sleep, they would stop aggregating with each other. They'll start binding, stop binding with each other. They will stop releasing more activating factors. They would stop releasing thromboxin A2, ADP, and that would cause the clot that is already there to start breaking down and further clotting would stop as well. So that is the function of the apoprosinol. I hope this makes sense. And I would then, this was a quick chat today. I'll go back to this little diagram and I'll stop here. So I hope you, you enjoyed this lecture. It was actually just a very quick one for how apoprosinol work. Tomorrow we'll continue with the other drugs in the same session for the math plus. So Anthony is saying that how does vitamin K affect this? So Anthony, I am actually going to talk about vitamin K as an independent structure as well. Vitamin K is an important uh, component of the blood clotting factor. So other than two parts of the intrinsic pathway, all other steps of coagulation require vitamin K. So we'll talk about it. So very good. Thank you very much for joining today. It is it was quick, but it is a very, very fascinating study. Um, please like, subscribe, and share. Thank you very much for your time, and we will go from there. I am still preparing that case that I wanted to present, so it would take me a couple of days to kind of put it together and make sure that when I present it to you, it is prepared. Plus, there is a doctor from Minnesota. She uh, called me today. Her name is Dr. Vendana. She wanted to talk. She had a few questions as well, and I said, why not? you join me and we have those questions together. So probably this Friday, day after tomorrow, she will join me as well and we'll talk about some of the questions that even medical community is discussing and we'll discuss those with you. So thank you very much. So there is a question from Abdul saying, why don't you use selective COX-2 inhibitors and inhibit thromboxane A2? Look, we can use for example, steroid, which is phospholipase A2 inhibitor, and that would inhibit the um, coagulation as well. We can use aspirin as well. We can use COX-1 inhibitor as well. Selective COX-2 inhibitors have been known to cause cardiac issues. So using them is a little bit more risky, or we can use apoprosinol as well. So if you look at math plus protocol, they're not saying that just use apoprosinol. They are saying to use heparin, they are, or uh, enoxaparin, which is low molecular weight heparin. They are asking to use a uh, tissue plasminogen activator, which is also a blood thinner. And then they are asking to use epiprosinol. So there are multiple ways that we can do blood thinning. So thank you. Thank you very much for being here. And we'll talk. We'll continue with the other drugs tomorrow. And on Friday, day after tomorrow, we'll have a doctor with us as well. And we'll discuss some of the questions that medical doctors are talking with each other as well and kind of thinking about them. So thank you and talk to you tomorrow.